Hey, thanks for stopping by Next Level Carpentry. Observant viewers have probably noticed this set of storage shelves showed up in the shop here oh, a few videos back when I was just starting the uh, best box beam videos. And a number of people have asked since I moved into this new shop if I show um, different things that I build as I move in and uh, get comfortable with the shop. And this set of shelves is one of those sort of things. I shot the video a couple months back, but uh, truth be told, I just fought with it. Uh, the camera screwed up. Uh, I had the video settings wrong. The audio was screwed up. I had to get a new microphone and transmitter for this thing, so the audio is a mess. Um, I was in a hurry and frustrated with the process, so the project just kind of fought me all the way along. But I thought that uh, now that I've calmed down uh, and some of the frustration has gone out, that I could put the video together so you could see how I made these shelves. And if you want to see how to make the shelves, it's all here in the video. Uh, if you want to be entertained, uh, you probably should switch to HGTV because this uh, was a difficult video to produce and it's probably a bit difficult to watch. But there's some good information there of how I used regular construction lumber to create these shelves. So I'm just doing this new introduction. There's another introduction that follows the one I originally shot for the video. I'll just leave them both in there. But uh, this kind of explains uh, how the video rolled out and why it's showing up now instead of a couple months ago when I first started it. Hi, and welcome to Next Level Carpentry. As you can see, the shop is in total disarray and piled with materials. Uh, the materials are for the oak box beam project that I'm working on, and the clutter and disarray is from boxes that aren't put away since the move to this new shop last summer. So I decided to take a step back today and build a set of functional, sturdy, clean storage shelves for underneath this overhang. Eventually I'm going to build some nice drawers to contain all the stuff that I now keep in cardboard boxes. But I want to do that project right when the time comes, but I need to get the shop cleaned up and organized in the meantime. So I just wanted to do this quick video showing how I build these shelves and the tricks I use to get a better quality finished product out of regular construction lumber. I won't go into a lot of detail about each little step along the way, but I want to give you an overview of the process. So here I am at my favorite lumber yard, sorting through a stack of 2x12s, 8 feet long, that I'll use for these shelves. This is a fine pile of lumber for framing, but I'm able to sort through and pick out ones that just look better than the rest. The ones that I'm passing over are still fine for structural work, and in some cases they're actually more suited to it, because I'm looking for straight ones for these shelves, where a slight crown actually adds strength in a structural framing situation. After sorting through and grabbing all the 2x12s I'll need, I regroup and go through a small pile of 2 2x8 eight, eight footers for the pieces I need for gluing up to make 2x18 lumber for the center section of the shelves. I always appreciate the privilege of being able to sort through a pile for cosmetic pieces and try to return that respect by restacking the lumber after I've sorted through it. I think leaving a messy stack behind gives carpenters a bad reputation with the guys at the lumber yard, and that's the last thing I want to do. Back at the shop, I'm able to back up to the overhead door and unload the pieces on sawhorses in the shop. The first step in making these storage shelves is to cut the pieces to rough length. Because I got eight footers, I can cut them in half because all shelf pieces are four feet long or less. Cutting these eight footers in half helps with milling because shorter boards are easier to straighten and flatten. Since I hand selected all these pieces, they're in really good shape, so I don't need to flatten them on the joiner first. I can just sort through them and then start by taking a few passes off each face with the thickness planer. Naturally, with all this planing, I've got to empty out the bins on the G700 dust processor as I go through planing all the boards. I go through the whole stack of boards, alternating one face and then the other to plane them till they're all cleaned up, smooth, and uniform thickness. Once all the pieces are planed to uniform thickness, I'll joint the edges and then match up the grain for the 18 inch wide pieces for the center shelf section. Once all the prep work is done, it's time to glue up these 2x18 pieces. I put the pieces in the vise and clamp them vertically and then scrape the glue from the joints to clean everything up. And with that bit of effort, I've got some beautiful 2x18s to work with. There's a fair amount of work involved in all those steps for planing and joining and gluing up, but those extra steps really make the end product come out a whole lot better. And I think it's great when you can take regular construction materials and add value to the project just by adding labor and going through some steps to dress up and refine the wood so that the end 
result of the project comes out better. Same material, same investment of money, but a much better end result. Now that all the milling and joining and glue up is done, the next step is to trim these parts to width and cut them to length before going on to doing the dado joinery on the sides before assembling the shelves. And it's kind of a kick to build something out of a 2x18 once in a while, isn't it? Since the depth of the shelf isn't that critical, I'm going to go through and trim all these parts till all the edges are clean so that the final depth is actually determined by how bad the worst shelf is and how much I need to take off to clean them up. As long as I end up about 18 inches deep for the deep ones and about 11 for the shallower ones, it's all good. I like to wear blue Smurf gloves when working with large smooth pieces like this. It gives me better grip and control so that the milling comes out like it's supposed to. I work through the entire stack by joining one edge straight and I go through the stack again, ripping the opposite edge parallel to the first and then replaning the sawn edge. So both edges are flat, smooth and parallel. Next, I switch from the Freud rip blade to a Freud crosscut blade and trim one end of each shelf piece square and true. With one end square, I set the fence and then carefully crosscut the other end of each piece so that all the verticals and all the horizontals are of identical length and square on both ends. I'm doing this carefully with my Osborne EB3 miter fence. And this panning shot shows the precision of these parts once I've gone through these steps in this sequence. And it's a whole lot better looking than it was when I took it off the truck. I suppose I've got about three hours of milling into this stuff, give or take. But the result is construction grade lumber that is now cabinet shop accurate for building the shelves. Before I throw these scraps out, I just want to have a little discussion about the strength of a glued joint that goes with the grain. The point I want to make is that a properly prepared glued and clamped joint is always stronger than the wood itself. In the glue up process, I wasn't using biscuits or pocket screws or splines or dominoes or dowels. It's just a square straight joint that's glued properly and clamped. The reason I don't use any of those accessories in a clean straight joint like this is because it's a waste of time because the glue joint is always stronger than the wood itself. You can see that there's a glue joint here. And that it didn't fail on the joint itself. It split the wood next to the glue joint. Here's another example. It's a little short connection. But even at that, it cracked next to the joint in the point of maximum stress. One more example. Even at that, it cracks away from the joint every time. Here's the last example I have. I'll hit it right at the joint, but it won't crack on the glue line because the glue is actually stronger than the wood itself. It gives you an insight into how strong the glue is and how relatively weak the wood is when it's stressed or stressed parallel with the grain. I use every one of the joining methods that I mentioned, pocket holes, biscuits, dowels, splines, everything or any of the above for certain applications. But gluing up straight pieces along the grain of the wood isn't one of those times. So I suggest that making sure your equipment is tuned up and running properly with sharp blades and that your method and workflow give you perfectly straight joints for glue up is a better use of your time than a bunch of unnecessary fasteners for applications like this. This stack here is the vertical pieces. These are all the shelves or the horizontals. And I made the vertical pieces a half inch narrower um, than the horizontals. Might be able to see it here. Just this half inch difference. The wide verticals and the wide shelves are the same. They're a half inch difference. And that allows me to put a thumbnail edge on the ends and the fronts of all these shelves. And adding that little thumbnail edge on all the shelves gives the end product a nice finished look. It's pretty simple to do with an oversized roundover bit and I'm going to do that next before I call it a day. I'm able to easily put a thumbnail edge on the fronts of these shelves by using an oversized roundover bit and not setting the cut to the full depth. I just noticed I shot the last two hours of video and time lapse with the camera on a different setting that made everything look sepia toned. Geez, I need a film crew. Well, anyways, 
I'll put a thumbnail profile on the front edge of all the shelves. And rather than get a dedicated thumbnail profile bit, which is kind of locked into the radius and the shelf thickness, I just take an oversized roundover bit so I can adjust the amount of thumbnail profile by raising and lowering the bit depending on the thickness of the wood that I'm working with and how much of a thumbnail profile I'm after. And personally, I think the thumbnail profile strikes a nice balance between a full bull nose and eased corners on the edges of a shelf. I set the bit too deep for this first pass, so it left a little lip in the middle of the thumbnail. I just raised the bit a skosh and take another pass so that the upper and lower passes with the router are tangent on the bulge of the thumbnail. And that setting is the sweet spot. It's got a very nice thumbnail profile, but it doesn't have an overlap mark like this or a flat spot that you get if the bit's not set deep enough. So I'm gonna go with that. There's a couple things to point out for the process of bullnosing these edges. First off, I look the piece over and decide which edge I want to be the front edge of the shelf. Because the thumbnail pass is taking a fair amount of material, the corner wants to chip if I just start routing from one end. So my first pass is actually climb cutting, which is running the router backwards across the edge. That way the edge doesn't splinter. So then the finish pass, going the right direction, isn't removing as much material and is far less likely to splinter. I want to terminate the ends of each shelf with the thumbnail profile, but I don't like the way my first two attempts came out doing it with the router. So I'll just add the thumbnail with a belt sander when I'm all done. This is kind of a bummer at this stage of the game, but as I routed the thumbnail profile, a splinter appeared on the edge of this shelf. I noticed there was a small split earlier, but it developed into a full-fledged mess during the final stage. So as annoying as this is, it's also the reality of working with construction grade lumber. This sort of a split doesn't affect the integrity of the piece in a framing situation. But for these shelves, it's going to be a pain, and it's right on the front edge. So I'm just going to go ahead and fix this and show you how to deal with this sort of frustration if you run into it. I'll just bust the whole thing off, and then take a stiff wire brush to the surface. That'll remove any loose fibers that'll get in the way of gluing it back up. piece will have a nice clean fit if I slide it right back into place like that. And one thing I'll say about a glue up like this is that you've got one chance to get it right or ruin the piece. If your first repair doesn't work you've got no chance for a second because you need perfectly clean wood surfaces with no glue residue to expand the joint. I'm using Type Bond 3 glue here. It's nice stuff. This is a time when you wouldn't want to use a real thick, heavy bodied wood glue because it prevents the joint from closing up. I'm just taking a toothbrush, brushing it down into those fibers real nice. And I'll soak the brush in dihydrogen oxide while I'm working here so that glue doesn't harden up. But of course the toothbrush won't stay where I put it. Next I take the piece that's going to fit back here and work it into place. And the key is to pull it back off and make sure that you got 100% coverage on both surfaces. There's some voids in here. Just want to make sure all those voids are filled. Doesn't have to be, doesn't have to be a lot of glue, but it all needs to be wet. That way the glue will migrate under the pressure, clamping pressure of the tape. In that toothbrush are not getting along. 
Then I wiggle this back into place. I want to make sure there's good glue squeeze out around the entire perimeter of the repair. I'll make an initial cleanup with a putty knife. To scrape excess glue off the surface, but some cleanup will be inevitable when the glue is dry because of the masking tape used to clamp it in place. I'm using 1 inch 3M masking tape. You've heard me say before that I don't use the 10 rolls for a dollar stuff. I'm just getting good pressure, making sure the end is lined up perfectly flush. Just apply good pressure both directions. As you clamp this down, you'll see more glue come out of the joint, which is just fine. If you pull too hard, the tape will break, so just do it again. I'd love to use the super glue on this, but it's just too large of a gluing surface to get it to all stick at once. So I'll have to be content with this drying for a couple hours instead of a few minutes. The nature of this crack being so wide this way allows me to put some other clamps on the side to make sure this thin edge gets pressed in and doesn't create a wide glue joint or a bump in the finished piece. This is definitely an oversized clamp, but it'll do it nicely. And I'm being careful that this clamping pressure doesn't lift the piece up and keep this surface from being flush. Like I said, these clamps are a little bit ridiculous considering the size of the project, but these rubber pads do a really nice job of giving even pressure on that thin edge so that the repair will virtually disappear. And the bottom line is it's nice that I didn't have to scrap this piece or start over because that defect showed up so late in the game. I was able to just repair it in place, salvage the piece, and move on. Once the glue is all dry, I've got a mess of glue squeeze out on here, but that's just inevitable with the way this needs to be clamped. It's such a small area, it's no big deal to clean it up now that the glue is dry. The tape is really stuck on here, especially where it was under a clamp. But a sharp putty knife will clean up any residue. by scraping and then a light sanding with 120 grit. Repairing that huge splinter is pretty much no big deal. After my first attempts to thumbnail the ends of these shelves with the router bit failed, I simply lay them out with a quick pencil mark and then create a thumbnail profile using the belt sander and then finish by touching it up with one of my best blocks for demanding sanding. The end result is a thumbnail that wraps around the end of the shelf in the same profile as on the face with a little round over transition so the shelf fits nice with the uprights. The next step is to lay out the verticals for the shelf locations. So I clamp them together and using a square mark the notches that I'll make with a dado blade to hold the shelves. I use a dado blade set for a fat three quarters of an inch to rabbit the top and bottom ends of all the verticals. Because the notch is close to an inch and a half it has to be made in two passes. So I get the depth set right and then set the width with the rip fence. I take the first pass on all the tops and all the bottoms of all the verticals, then reset the fence over to allow for the inch and three eighths shelf thickness and make a second pass to complete the rabbits on the top and bottom. Once the top and bottom rabbits are complete, I use the rip fence to measure and lay out the dados for each of the shelf locations on the faces of the narrow and wide uprights. I use the same fence setting for each shelf height so that all the shelves line up straight and parallel in the finished assembly. Each of these dados takes two passes as well, so I do them in two steps, one for the top 
of the dado and one for the bottom. The last thing I'll do on these uprights before assembly is to hit the corners that will be exposed in the finished installation with a 3 16 round over bit. I mark the corners that will get routed with a black magic marker ahead of time so I don't miss any that need to be rounded off and I don't hit any that I want to be left square. And for the few minutes it takes to add that little finishing touch, the end result will have a much more finished look when the shelves are installed. I'm plowing a shallow rabbit in the bottom back of each of the top shelves. The rabbit will help index and secure the cleat that supports most of the weight when these hanging cabinets are screwed to the wall. I'm doing this with an eighth inch flat top grind blade just because it's quicker and easier for this step than to use a dado blade. I make the rabbit in two passes so that I get a full eighth inch depth out of this eighth inch blade. And with those two passes you can see I have a very clean, quick and even rabbit. It'll index the cleat that I'll screw in here and use to attach the shelves to the wall. The last step before I start assembly is to freehand a small notch or blind rabbet in the top back corner of each of the vertical shelf pieces. That's inch three eighths by two and seven eighths. I can score the lines for routing to make the freehand notch process simpler. Pairing them up and clamping them together makes the notching process a little quicker. This straight cut bit is set to the depth of the rabbit made with the table saw. And I'll just route kind of close to those lines. I basically route as close to those lines as I dare because I just want to make sure I don't go past the line. And I score these lines extra deep. And then come in horizontally at the bottom to free up that little piece. The end grain in the corners is the hardest spot, but with a few extra cuts it comes out nice and clean. If I was doing more of these, or they had to be more precise, I'd use the templating method shown in the video for making precision templates. But for this shelf project, freehanding it is good enough. Because in a lot of cases, this support cleat on the upper back of the cabinets would just be cut in between the two standards without the bother of a notch. Uh, by now, it should be no surprise that I didn't film a Segway video segment to transition from when I finished working on the shelf parts until I started doing the assembly. Uh, that's the transition right here and right now. And I'm using this little filler video clip to fill in the gap. I hope you're able to follow along with the process of making all this stuff up to this point. Uh, unfortunately, the video and audio doesn't get a whole lot better going forward, but uh, feel free to put stuff in the comments if there's gaps in here that leave you confused since having these shelves installed and functional for a couple of months. I think they're pretty awesome, so I hope it's something that helps you guys out uh, when you're thinking about building shelves for your shop space or storeroom. So now I'll get back to it. Shelves are a tight fit. I plane a small micro bevel on the edge, on the ends of the shelves. After using a rubber mallet to tap the shelf into the dado, I use a snappy pilot countersink bit to prep the hole, and then I'm using these two and three quarter inch long GRK Torx drive construction screws to attach the shelf to the upright. A pilot hole makes a nice clean fit for the countersunk screw head without volcanoing at the surface. 
I prefer to size the dados a little bit on the narrow side because I can add that small micro bevel and then position the shelf and tap it in place with the rubber mallet for a very snug fit. That snug fit keeps the shelf from warping and also makes the connection stronger when I pilot hole and drive in the construction screws to hold it all together. When I drill the pilot hole and countersink, I leave it on the shallow side. That way, when the screw is driven so the head is flush with the wood, it's pulling everything tight together. If the countersink is too big in the first place, the head gets buried before it has enough pulling power to snug up the separate pieces. After screwing the first two shelves into the upright, I can set the assembly on the floor, and that gives me a better working height. Then I'll paint micro bevels on the ends of the shelves and set the second upright on the end, tap everything into place, then drill the pilot holes and screw it together. Once the shelves and uprights are attached to themselves, I can rotate the assembly on the floor and install the top and the bottom shelves. I've got that shallow rabbit in the back and the bottom of the top shelf. And it lines up with the rabbit in the top of the ends or the sides. And that will accept a cleat board that goes across the back for attaching the cabinets to the wall. This sequence is a little more simple than attaching all four shelves to one upright and then trying to maneuver it around to install the second side. I put three screws in the top and the bottom shelf because they're not held in place by that dado. Accurate joinery, good screw placement, and a tight fit everywhere make it so that glue really isn't necessary for this particular shelf. Typical to the way this video shoot went, I neglected to film the sequence of installing the top cleat in the back upper corner of the shelves. Basically it's a 2x4, the same thickness as the rest of the material. Cut the 3 inches wide it gets installed in the rabbit on the underside of the top shelf and the small blind rabbits in the top corners of the uprights. With a sufficient amount of GRK construction screws, this cleat provides the majority of strength for attaching the cabinets to the walls. Once I got all three shelf units assembled, it was time to move out the things that I had piled up underneath the overhang, sweep up the dust, and then load and raise these cabinets to screw them into place. I've got this cool hydraulic lifting platform table that I never used, but it worked really slick for this. I was able to quickly raise the cabinets into place, tap them until they were in the exact position, and then attach them to the wall and attach them to each other, all without breaking a sweat. Since I milled all the framing lumber to even thickness and width and screwed everything together with cabinet joinery, all the connections are very solid, pieces are all flat, and the shelf units are all square, so they go in without much of a fight. The screws through the cleat in the back hold most of the weight, and there's a few screws that go through the top shelf up into the bottom of the soffit. I got the shelves all screwed into place using the regular GRK Torx construction screws, but for the final attachment, I'm going to upgrade to these GRK Torx lags. These screws are four inches long and hold like crazy. And I prefer to use a regular cordless drill on the low power setting for driving these screws. It just makes a smoother and much quieter installation compared to using an impact driver for the same purpose. With a couple screws like that into this cleat, which is attached to the top shelf with about six of the regular screws, is more than adequate to hold this shelf up for pretty much anything I decide to load on it. Well, I want to thank you for checking out this video. If you like it, smash that thumbs up button and consider subscribing to Next Level Carpentry if you haven't already. I kind of breezed over a lot of the technical aspects of this build. The shelves are pretty simple and straightforward, but I wanted to focus on the type of a finished product you can get starting out with just standard construction lumber. Details of the glue up process and the various milling process you'd be able to see in other Next Level Carpentry videos where I go more in depth on those phases of a project. But I hope you can take lessons learned from this video and adapt them to various shelving projects that you might need to get taken care of.
The same shelf uh, design and assembly could be used for freestanding units that stand on the floor um, and change to various lengths, widths, and depths uh, by using the same methods and the same principles. I don't know if I spelled it out in the video, but it's important with this kind of construction lumber because it comes from a, a lumber yard where the temperature and humidity aren't controlled. And once you move them into a dry shop environment, the wood can change rapidly. So it's pretty important to mill the lumber, uh, finish it up and get it all assembled so that the configuration keeps the wood flat and stable. If you let it sit around unrestricted, the pieces can warp, cup and twist pretty severely as they stabilize to their new environment. I barely got away with it on those shelves that got ripples in them as the wood started to dry. And there may well be some checking in these uh, various shelf components as this wood gets completely acclimated to a dry shop environment. But for the most part, the shallow rabbits are plenty to restrict that movement as the wood dries and reaches equilibrium. I'm glad to have these interim shelves complete and installed. I'm gonna get them all loaded up with stuff so I can go back to work in the shop. I did the time-lapse sequence of loading everything in these shelves uh, the day I finished installing them. A couple of months have gone by since then, but I'll explain that uh, I made these shelves hang up instead of mounting on the floor. One thing is the floor is pitched because of uh, the, the trench drain in the middle. And the other thing is I needed a place to park all these machines and this toolbox underneath here. And by suspending the shelves, I could accomplish uh, all the storage I need, parking the machines, and the floor still drains. So the design of the cabinets with that heavy cleat at the back, I didn't do a real good job of showing that in the video. That works awesome, holds them up there. They're screwed directly into the studs and you could take all the screws out of here except for those four uh, lags that hold each shelf up and they would just stay there fine. These aren't attached at all on the bottom. They're just hanging from the top. And you can see with the amount of stuff on here, uh, they're pretty stout. And these aren't light boxes. Uh, there's steel and screws and all sorts of heavy stuff. There's sharpening stones up there. So there's plenty of strength in the shelves and I hope that the design features of being able to make uh, hanging shelves instead of standing shelves will help you on a project somewhere along the way. And I even added a custom uh, hanger for the Merrill band clamps that I like so much and they fit right there on the end of the shelf. Sweet as can be. Basically the hanger consists of a square block of cherry that's screwed to the side of the cabinet. I could make the block longer or make two of them to hold additional clamps, but four seems to handle the projects I'm working on pretty well. I appreciate you spending this time with me in the shop today. I hope some of the tips and techniques from this build help you out on projects you're working on. And so, until the next time in the next video, thanks for watching.